I really like the smoothness at the tip. It's mm -hmm. in some ways easier to play than my bow, I think. The bow is often an aspect that gets overlooked when we start talking about really fine violins. It's really the other half of the instrument. So the average weight is 60 grams. Mm -hmm. I can give you a selection. This is a range from $2,000 to $20,000. Okay. The prices are on uh, the frog end and, mm -hmm. and the weights on the tip end. I mean, it's so even. You could spend $100 on a bow, you could spend $100,000 on a bow, but in the end, I think it's, you know, you just have to find the right bow that suits what you want. Port Townsend became the capital of bow making um, of the Western Hemisphere, like Paris is the, the capital, uh, primarily because of two people moving here, and that would be Charles Espy and Paul Seafried. Um, they came here independently of each other, but they're attracted um, by the boating culture. It's a marine town. It has a Victorian seaport that's uh, very charming. It attracted uh, a crowd of artisans um, that became bow makers here in town. I'm one of those. I studied with Charles. This one I made octagonal for you. It's a little different. And so I'm, I'm really proud to be of that heritage. My name is Zula Kainstrom, and uh, I'm a contemporary bow maker, trained in the French method of making bows. When I make a bow, there's a collaboration that happens with the player and myself. They want a certain sound, they want a certain playability, certain balance, feel, weight. I have to find the piece of wood that has that ring that'll bring out the qualities in the instrument that they want. It just happens to have some nice bend in it. It'll make my life easier. Do they want it bright? Do they want it to be soft and mellow? Do they want a, a richness of tone, uh, more intensity? Pernambuco is the primary wood for bow making uh, for the stick, and it has been since the late 1700s. It has all the qualities. It's the strength, the resilience. The, it's like spring steel. It uh, sings. It does everything. It's the magic music wood. We demand so many different things from our bows. You can have, you know, a spiccato motion, kind of this light, bouncy spiccato that requires insane kind of precision. It's the wood and the relationship of the wood with how it's graduated and cambered that brings out these magic qualities in the bow. They really are magic. They can make a, an instrument come alive or they can shut it down. So um, a bow is a powerful thing. Without a bow, a violin is just a really crummy mandolin. It just doesn't, it's nothing. So the bow is what, uh, what gives it life. But you might have, you know, long crashing chords that require a lot of sustain in the bow, and the bow has to have a great amount of power to be able to play, you know, three or four notes almost simultaneously. And then, you know, for really light, passage work, there's, you know, times where we're maybe using a couple hairs on the bow and it still has to be able to produce that sound. I mean, it's kind of amazing, both, you know, violins and bows are relatively unchanged in the last 350 years, and here we are, there are still people using bows today that are, you know, 100 years old, 200 years old, and then bows that were just made this year. and. Roughly, you know, they're pretty much exactly the same. The most satisfying thing to me about being a bow maker is the collaboration between me and the musician and knowing that something that I craft goes on to be a tool as an expression for um, their creative craft. <laughs>